So uh, there actually um, are uh, me, the moderator for the panel, and four panelists. Um, uh, and in addition to Susan as a panelist, uh, we have uh, Claire Moulton and Kirsty McCormick from the Company of Biologists. Uh, they are joining us uh, by telephone. Uh, Company of Biologists is located in Cambridge, UK. Uh, and Tracy de Pellegrin, uh, who is uh, now the uh, executive director for the Genetic Society of America, uh, uh, couldn't make it at the last minute, so she's going to join us uh, by telephone also. Tracy's located in Pittsburgh, so uh, not too far away. Uh, you might remember uh, that uh, at our uh, last meeting in this room, uh, we had a, a chorus uh, presentation. And I think probably the year before that, we might have also. Uh, and uh, what we were doing in those two previous presentations was basically getting the mechanics, uh, the, the, the what chorus is and does and how uh, set up. Uh, now what we want to do uh, is pivot a bit uh, uh, in talking about Chorus to explore uh, with publishers who are actually using it uh, and, uh, and a particular set of publishers, how they're using it and why they're using it uh, and you know, what are the bumps uh, in the road and, and how they've uh, handled them. So that's the reason to have uh, a more practical uh, panel uh, that is focused much more on uh, why we're doing this and how we're making it happen. Um, uh, full disclosure, Susan is chairman of the board of Chorus, uh, and I'm on the board of Chorus, uh, but we're not here really representing Chorus. Uh, at least, I'm not, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think full disclosure, I'm speaking about Rock Rockefeller. You're doing the entry yes. slides, though, yes. right, are you? Right, so I'm actually the one representing Chorus. That's an odd one. Uh, the, uh, but what we've done here is put together a panel of uh, pretty much biomedical publishers uh, where if we take a look, uh, oh, I should say, we're gonna do three topics. I'm gonna do quickly a chorus update uh, and uh, then we're gonna go through three questions with uh, the three organizations, Rockefeller, uh, Genetics, and Company of Biologists, and then we'll have uh, some time for Q&A at the end. So I'm gonna do the, uh, the, uh, the Chorus update, uh, just a few slides. Chorus now has uh, several dozen members. 15. 18? 15. 15. Just, no, 50. 50, I was gonna say several dozen. Yeah. I didn't count, there, there are too many to count. That's why I didn't count. Uh, and uh, a lot of them are uh, relatively larger publishers, uh, often in areas uh, of the hard sciences, uh, physical sciences, uh, but in particular in this panel, we wanted to pull together uh, life science publishers and understand specifically uh, the background of Chorus for them. The number of funding agencies uh, working with Chorus has grown, uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, there's some uh, pretty interesting ones here. Uh, if you look uh, at the, uh, the right hand of the slide, uh, you'll see that there are two pilots. Uh, NIST is, is now piloting with Chorus, uh, but perhaps one of the most interesting uh, pilots is an international one, the Japan Institute of Science and Technology is now piloting with Chorus. So that's Chorus, essentially core US becoming core international. And then another uh, pilot uh, that I wanted to, to highlight quickly uh, was uh, the first institutional pilot. Uh, and this is really interesting. This is essentially saying, hey, uh, institutions, higher education institutions in particular, are having trouble populating uh, their uh, repositories. It's just, it's very manual, uh, it, uh, and uh, compliance is, is very difficult to get. Uh, and so Chorus and uh, uh, the University of Florida have uh, linked up to say, we have the data that would help you uh, recognize where you need uh, to, to populate your repository. So I think this is a, a plus other, uh, other capabilities. I think this is a very interesting pilot to look at and might uh, uh, be a service that publishers through Chorus uh, can offer other institutions who are dealing with problems of repositories. 
Uh, so, uh, Ophir, do we have our panelists on the line? Panelists, are you on the line? Uh, do, do we have um, people on the phone? No, uh, not yet. Okay. Uh, she's looking for the phone. <laughs> oh. I don't oh. have it. I do not have the phone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we've, got, we've got many phones in the room. I'm sure we can, <laughs> we can, we can make this work if we have to. Uh, so uh, we're going to go through three questions. Here are the three questions. Um, and you might think yourselves about uh, your own answers to these if you have previously considered uh, Chorus membership. Uh, the first question is, how did you decide uh, to uh, join Chorus? That was what, what led you, what were the decision factors, the numbers, uh, et cetera. Uh, the second is uh, very nuts and bolts. What's the workflow? Uh, because it's not, you know, uh, toss stuff at, at a database and hope it sticks. There's really a lot involved. Uh, and uh, the nice thing is that there is now, I think, some best practice emerging uh, on that. So we'll look uh, specifically at some slides uh, on uh, workflow. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, what are the bumps in the road? Uh, that is, uh, what if, if the question I often ask uh, our speakers to address, uh, if you had it to do over again, what uh, would you do differently? Well, what, what bumps have you encountered? Uh, where are the challenges? So as we go into these, if, um, if we don't have all the speakers on the line, what I'll do is rather than go through them question by question, I'll go through them institution, I'll go through them first with Rockefeller, uh, then with uh, uh, company biologists, then with GSA. Give me a, um, a one more minute. All right, then we'll, we'll start with Susan. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, the first question, again, was how did you decide? Uh, and, and what I asked the speakers to think about is uh, how did their author pool and their author's funders uh, map to the funders participating in Chorus? Uh, was that a key issue? Uh, or was there some other uh, uh, key thing that convinced you that uh, Chorus was a solution uh, to work with? Uh, so, Susan, do you want to uh, Absolutely. Into that? Can, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, thank you up here. So um, in terms of our author pool, I mean, we publish three journals in the biomedical uh, and in life sciences area. You know, the vast majority of our authors um, are actually funded by DHSS, mainly from NIH, get NIH funding. And as, as many of you do, we do deposit the final version of our, a final version, of, uh, final articles um, to PubMed Central. But we also publish articles from NSF, DOD, DOE, USDA, and USAID. Um, we knew this before your know, chorus started. We'd actually, one of the nice things of be, being a university press is we are connected to a university that has a library. So we were able to do some um, mining of Scopus and Web of Science and the like to actually identify the range of authors that uh, are the funding sources of authors that publish in our journals. Now, of, of course, which is really great for us as a Chorus member, we actually have our Chorus dashboard, which allows us a way of tracking and visualizing real time the amount of content that we have coming from authors of different funding agencies. So although we were predominantly publishing um, articles from authors that were funded by NIH, we felt it was important to publish, uh, to jo join Chorus, because deposit in PubMed Central is not sufficient for those other funding uh, agencies that I men mentioned. And specifically, for instance, when it comes to NSF, NSS is obligating those that it funds to deposit their accepted manuscript in um, an NSF repository, and will surface that after a year. We feel really strongly at RUP that the public should have access to the same amount of, the same value, the same degree of content that our researchers do. We make our content openly available after six months. So partnering with Chorus allows us to be able, the NSF, instead of surfacing that accepted manuscript, will point exclusively to the version of record that's publicly available on our site. So for that, that was a really attractive thing to do. Did I help answer your question? Yes. Do you want me to carry on going, John? Nope. Okay. Uh, that's great. 
Uh, so uh, Claire or Kirsty, do you want to uh, pick up? I'll, I will put the first uh, of your slides up on the screen. Thank you, John. This is Claire speaking. Um, so uh, like Rockefeller University Press, we have um, a, a small range of journals in the biomedical area. So that's really just to show the scope of the journals that we publish. And on the next slide, um, we've got some information about how our author pool maps to um, Chorus and other initiatives. Um, so a, a reasonably similar story. We already had a lot of NIH authors, and we had PMC deposition already in place. And that will now cater to some of the other um, authors um, whose funders have, um, have, plumped, have plumped for PMC as their deposition solution. Um, we do have quite a lot of authors funded by NSF, and that was really the reason that we went ahead and joined Chorus um, at the beginning of 2016. Um, but uh, as Susan mentioned, it's really useful having the Chorus dashboard. Um, so I did expect a few DOE articles, but I didn't realize that I was going to see a Smithsonian article, so that was quite nice and pleasing as well. Wow. Um, but there are other funders who have gone for other repositories, and we have you know, a relatively small number of articles um, from those funders. But we feel strongly that complying with funder mandates is part of our author service, and we really would like to be able to um, provide a, a proper deposition um, service for um, for authors, um, which we we don't do we won't be doing currently for the um, for the authors in the third group of funders. So we do allow them to deposit themselves the version of record um, when it's mandated. Um, but I guess better than deposition, of course, is um, using the chorus route of having readers access the articles on our own site where we can get our own messages across and we can also track the people, um, the readership of our articles. And so obviously for us, chorus is the best option of these three. That's, that's it, John. Thank yes. you. Thanks. Uh, Tracy? Hi, um, this is Tracy DePellegrin with the Genetic Society of America. Um, as a visual aid, if you are all online, um, I would encourage you to go to www.genetics.org um, so that uh, I'm going to use that to illustrate the answer to, to one of these questions. But um, I think like uh, a COB and RUP, um, our authors are largely actually in uh, NIH. Um, we have about 65% of them. Um, NIH and NIGMS, uh, which, as you know, is not yet a chorus partner, um, and uh, the rest are uh, USDA. Um, for NSF and DOE, we have about 13 percent. So that wasn't necessarily the impetus for us to um, to join chorus, but you know, this is the situation now, and we we assume that that will improve. And kind of a nice thing is we do have a handful of uh, Japan Institute of Science and Technology um, funded authors. Not so many, but we have some. And so the pilot program um, going on now is interesting to us. Um, we publish, uh, we have two journals. We have Genetics, which is a, a, a traditional subscription-based journal with open access options. And we also have um, G3, which, uh, which is our open access journal. Um, as far as what convinced us that course was a solution, Howard, are you in the room somewhere? Oh, no, sorry, Tracy. Howard's not in the room. He's actually at the AIPPP okay. Library Advisory Board talking about chorus. So uh, I'll try and okay. be, I'll try and channel him, Tracy. So what, <laughs> so what convinced me was Howard. Um, Howard walked up, uh, walked up to me at, I think it was a high wire meeting, and he, he recruited GSA right, right into chorus, and I was compelled uh, listening to, to him speak about the chorus and, and his reasons for um, why it would be good for publishers. But, you know, primarily um, the, the infrastructure that chorus has invested in and, and is working on was appealing to us. Um, we're very much into best practices, and we'd like the clear rules and standards for everyone. Um, we like the rigorous audit process that they have. Um, and like most of, most of you, if not all of you, right, we, we like that, of course, directs readers back to the journal site instead of, um, instead of uh, PubMed Central or another kind of repository. So the, and the reason why I wanted to show you, so this is where um, my shout out to Highwire comes in. 
uh, I think when I spoke last year with with uh, with each of, or all of you rather, we were working on our JCore site, and it is now um, launched and and beautiful. And thank you, Highwire. And so we have a, we have invested a lot of resources into this site, and we really want our authors um, or readers rather to go there. Um, and I guess last. Lastly, um, we're a smaller publisher, um, and if you look at the, the groups of publishers course working with, we're probably we could be the smallest, I think. Um, and we like to um, we like to jump into innovations, and we consider ourselves to be high touch. We do things like deposit. Um, we make our deposits um, to funders on behalf of our authors. So the existing infrastructure and standards, of course, allowed us to take advantage of, um, I think, an otherwise um, unreachable program. Thanks. So we're uh, going to go on to the second question now, uh, which was, uh, what is your workflow for Chorus? Uh, and we have a slide for each of these, because I don't think you'd, you'd be able to handle just a, uh, uh, an oral description. Uh, Susan or, or Rob, do you want to? Have oh, fantastic, John. You, would, you did exactly what I was going to do, which was to welcome Rob up here, if you would like to come up here. Rob, would you like to come up here, or do you want to just stand, take it from there? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's it's kind of lonely. I've got all these seats up here. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, you're the one that implemented this. So um, do you want to have a look at the slide? I can put it up oh, for you. Here, here you go. There yeah. you go. So, there you go. Yeah, that's it. So, oh, there's it in bigger font. So um, while Rob familiarizes himself with the lovely slide that he built for me uh, based on the lovely workflow that we created here, I would say that one of the things that we recognized in RUP is, you know, and again, one of the reasons of getting into core is we want to try and reduce the burden on authors. Now, with our journals, um, we get a fair number of submissions, and a fair number of them are actually rejected. So we chose not to ask the author uh, and a submission system to provide their funding information, because we felt that that was adding another click, another thing for them to do. And um, if we were going to be rejecting uh, them, which we do for many, that that would be not a good thing. Why make people do work that they don't need to do? So for us, really, what we're doing is we're looking, once articles are accepted and coming into our, our um, workflow and then looking at the acknowledgement section, um, taking the funding agency information from that and then presenting it back to the author, uh, proof for validation. Is that right, Rob? Because right. okay. I can't see anything from here, I tell you. It's really bright, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess, can I punt it over to you and you want to describe a little bit more, Rob? Or? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, I'm not sure how much all of you are familiar with what's necessary for a course, but the, the two main factors are funding data and uh, license tagging, which includes the type of license and the free, free to access date um, using alley tagging. So as Susan said, we're tagging funding data in production from acknowledgments, and that's all been going just fine. But uh, to start up, at the, uh, up front, um, and full disclosure, this workflow is not fully executed yet. But the plan is, uh, in our submission system, we will be tagging, well, we'll have the authors tag. There's, there's a lot here. Sorry, sorry. I, was, I wasn't ready for this. So, so um, we're, we're starting an open access option, um, which, would, which would be uh, CCBY licensing. Our regular licensing is CCBYNC, and it's free after six months. Open access, obviously, free at day one. So in our tracking system, when the author chooses which license type they want, we will obviously uh, register that in the tracking system. That gets passed to our production system. And what will happen is the production system, when creating our metadata, will calculate the six-month date for those articles that are CCBYNC based on the issue, the, the cover date of the issue. And that will be put into the license tagging. So in the end, we'll end up with um, whether or not the, it's free, what day it is free, uh, all of the funding data will be will be tagged. So what we're doing there, just to go into a little more detail, is we are mining acknowledgments. We have our copy editors reading, using the Crossref API to then um, input the uh, the funding name and getting the DOI back. Uh, and that covers it, I think, yeah. Sorry, Rob, to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and in, f in full disclosure, as Rob was saying, I mean, coming on to some of the other questions, um, and I think this is similar for Claire, also at Company of Biologists, you know, the, the licensing, uh, which we're still working on, was probably the biggest thing that we, we, we had to yeah. grapple with. 
But this was something that we recognized we were always going to have to grapple with. And so I think one of the things about the benefits of being with Chorus is being with other like-minded souls who are going through, who are wrestling through Absolutely. this. I mean, we are a, a small organization of many of you out there also. Uh, this allows, if you will, an opportunity for us to find out talking to other people who are implementing, how are they doing it? And develop some best practices that we feel that will work for our organization. Is that fair? That's fair. All right, uh, I'm going to uh, now move on to the COB workflow. So uh, if Kirsty or Claire would like to comment on the slide. Thanks, John. Uh, this is Kirsty here. Um, so um, unlike RUP, we do collect the funder information at submission um, using BenchPress. Um, and I understand, I mean, it does have pros and cons, which we'll perhaps talk about a bit later. But um, we, we are collecting at submission, and we found we do post our accepted manuscripts online in advance of the issue. So um, it does allow us to collect that funding data early, and we are depositing that funding information um, in Crossref for those uh, advanced online articles as well. Uh, so it, it's quite similar. The rest of the, the process is quite similar to RUP. Um, we're also later extracting the, the funding data from the manuscript through the compositor. Um, and then um, we have to have the, the, the step of um, comparing then what's in the manuscript and what was submitted through BenchPress. So, so we have our copy editors um, compare the two uh, and, and do some sort of checking through Crossref as well. Um, and then um, at the author proof stage, we have the XML conversion. Um, so all the funder names, again, are, are validated using the Crossref um, API. Um, and then that's all transferred into the article XML. Um, we also display the, the, the final funding metadata displayed in the, the PDF proof so that the authors can check that, confirm they're happy with it. We remove that, though, before final uh, pagination stages. Um, there's the usual corrections which are passed on and, and all the, the XML is updated. And then right at the end, the, the JET XML is then delivered to Highwire, which then is passed on to Crossref um, with the funding info, the license info, ORCID IDs are in there. Um, and the compositor adds the, the start date for the public access for us. Um, at that last stage. Uh, so, so yeah, that, that, that's our workflow. A, a question for you, uh, Kirsty. Uh, in this, the copy editing step, uh, do you find that uh, you've got 15% errors or 50% errors or 80% errors? I mean, how much uh, correction are you doing of the funding metadata? Uh, we find, well, for the, for the papers we, we post um, in advance, um, I think we're, we're getting about 80% correct. I mean, you get many different types of errors, um, but it's definitely improving from how we, when we first started out, um, we found we've, we've had to sort of um, tailor our, our author instructions a bit more and, and get the authors used to putting in the data how we want it. But um, I think 70 to 80% correct is, okay. is about right. Thank you. Uh, let me go on to uh, Tracy now. Uh, and uh, Tracy, in, in, in one of the things that uh, folks who were here uh, uh, a year ago might remember is that you uh, talked about uh, format neutral submissions uh, as something that you were doing that was delighting authors. Uh, uh, and you know that there are relatively few things we all do that delight authors. And, and so this was a, a, a big step. Um, uh, in the context of a format neutral submission, um, which means that authors basically can submit any, any type of document that, they, that they'd like. Uh, uh, and you then go and, and uh, require uh, complete submission, metadata, and so on, at the stage when you've, uh, you've said, yes, we're moving this, this paper through our system. Uh, so, so Tracy, is, is step one the original submission, uh, uh, the first submission, or is it the stage where you've said, okay, now we need a, a formal submission? So um, th that's a really good question. 
And so this, these, all of these steps are, um, are upcoming. Um, they're not what we're doing now because we're still, we're, we're as we you may have uh, we said during the call, genetics and G3 are, are sort of the least advanced of, of the three publishers on the panel today. So this is what we, we will be doing. But the, in terms of the funder field, um, that's not going to be, at, at submission, that's not going to be mandatory, um, but that will be optional. Um, however, after acceptance um, at pre-processing, we will require at that time license and funder information to be entered if it's not already before it's transmitted to the compositor. All right. And then we have another step. I mean, that's a really good question. So what John's talking about, for those of you who, who may not have, have heard the talk last year, it's the genetics in G3 allow authors to submit um, form, a format neutral PDF, which is essentially um, they can turn around uh, if they've been rejected from another journal, uh, they can submit the PDF as is uh, without having to reformat references and say the order of the methods um, and discussion and things like that for us. So, I mean, that's just at the, at, at the review stage. And I think like, um, like Susan was saying, I mean, we do reject a fair amount of papers on the way in, so we don't really want to force them to jump through a lot of hoops at the beginning. Um, so otherwise, I think you can just read, these are the, these are the steps that, um, that we're going to be um, implementing once we settle on our license, which is really um, driving us mad. <laughs> um, and I think um, the steps are pretty standard with what the other, um, the other publishers have described. We are going to have the authors actually verify the funding data so, um, and the license in the proof. We're just going to query them. Uh, we have like several boxes um, to just ask them to verify certain elements and this is one that we, that we will have them sign off on again. All right. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we'll hear about licenses driving uh, publishers mad uh, several times in the, in the bumps in the road part of the uh, commentary. Uh, so, uh, Susan, do you want to uh, start with question three, then uh, we'll go to company of biologists? Sure. Um, so, um, in terms of how hard has it been to get going, um, as I say, I mean, as you heard, I think, from the other panelists, there are another number of sort of moving parts, and, and sort of getting them aligned has been um, a little bit of a juggling. Um, one of the reasons that we are um, not yet, if you will, fully chorus compliant, um, partly it's nailing down our license, but also we realized that we moved, needed to move to JATS 1.1. And um, first of all, we wanted to um, launch our new um, rev, rev, refresh of our website mm -hmm. on JCOR and encourage everybody to go and have a look at it. It just went live last week. So it's kind of another reason why we're a little bit slow in the chorus thing, because uh, we had other things to do. Um, you know, um, one of the things that um, I wish somebody had explained better just generally about going into this was that, that every funding agency is different. Every funding agency is uh, different in their systems, their workflows, their rulemaking. I could go on. In actual fact, I think that we ourselves are more alike about one another than funding agencies oh my God. are like. I know, so there you go. Um, and and the, I think uh, publishers are like herding cats. That's amazing. Well, but, but you know, I think, you know, you, sit, you, you hear us. Here's Tracy, Claire, and me all sitting up here saying, and Rob came up here saying, oh, we're a little bit lagging behind here. We're not quite mm. there yet. When did that OSTP memo go out? When was the deadline for agencies to have their plans up? I think the memo came out in February, right? August was when the plans were meant to be out. Of which year? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, this would be, in, what, 2014? 2014. And so not all the agencies have got their plans out yet. So, you know, whilst I think we may as an industry sort of individually beat ourselves up, um, the, the um, organizations that we're trying to please have not always been fast. And so I think that's given us time to, to figure things out and do things the way that works best for us. Um, 
So what were the bumps in the road? Well, I think that was the, um, the uh, you know, realizing that we needed the jets. You know, I wanted to uh, really thank Tracy, and I will, Tracy, mention your um, good words about Howard um, to him, because I do think that that is one of the strengths of Chorus, in that, you know, Howard Ratner, our executive director, sorry, I've now got my Chorus hat on, apologies, um, has been actively involved in the creation of all of these standards that are actually being knitted together for Chorus. Mm -hmm. So I think that was something that certainly made it attractive for uh, us as an organization that we recognized that this would work. We had somebody here who, who had a proven track record. Um, let me see, what, do I wish, what would I do differently now if I had to do it over? Um, I don't know, Rob. I don't know. I think we would, would we have done anything differently? I think that we would still be where we are, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so, um, so yeah, so I mean, I think it's been, you know, a little bit of juggling to get things going. Um, maybe no real bumps in the road, but having to wait for Jack's point one. You know, I do think that, um, you know, being part of a, an organization of other publishers that are wrestling with this has helped. You know, whilst, as, as John pointed out on that initial slide, you know, many of the organizations that are Chorus members are far, 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 far larger than um, RUP and our three um, fantastic, but only three journals. Um, you know, one of the key things I think about Chorus is that our bylaws require that the board of directors, the majority of the board of directors come from knots of profit. So a lot, though there are some large organizations there, there's the opportunity for smaller people like us to be able to have our say in terms of the direction of that organization. So I'll stop rambling now, John, um, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, uh, Claire uh, or Kirsty, bumps in the road. I have your slide up. Okay, thank you. So this is Claire. I just wanted to echo what Susan said that, you know, the communications out of the different funding agencies have been really hard to follow. And if you go and look at that on their sites now, they're still out of date. Um, and, you know, the, the communication route through Chorus has been quite good of pulling that information together, obviously with, um, you know, explaining how each funder relates to Chorus. Um, and, uh, you know, I find it quite difficult to keep up with the funders, even using the Chorus uh, communication flow. And uh, doing, you know, I'll be really honest that doing this, uh, preparing for this panel made me go back and, and go back through the different funders and what they've decided and how that related to us. Because we'd really focused on, you know, some of the key funders that we already knew were important to us. Um, and then, you know, in, in moving to um, implement um, these various changes, we actually do feel that a lot of the metadata changes are actually really good changes of information that is useful to have in a document and um, that we would quite, quite like to have moved to at some point anyway. Uh, it's just that this initiative has, has caused us to do it now. And I'll hand over to Kirsty. Um, yeah, I'll just maybe say a few problems we found with the, uh, the sort of practical side of the implementation and I'll try and be brief. Um, I don't know if you've got our slide there, John. Yes. Yep. Um, so, so, yeah, the main problem that I'm sure everyone's aware of is just getting the, the good metadata, the good funding metadata from the authors. And like I said, we, we did choose to, to ask authors for it at submission. Um, so the, the pro, the good side of this is it, it prompts authors to use the, the uh, Crossref widget, which provides a, a drop-down menu so they can choose the funder there, but um, so, so it, it you know prevents them from from just keying any any old thing which they might in their manuscript. Um, although you know we we do still have a few errors um, on that side. Um, the extra step is you then have to then compare the manuscript with the drop down menu that they provided, um, and of course that takes extra time. Um, getting the metadata early has been helpful, like I said, for our publisher head of print deposit. Um, and we're also thinking perhaps further down the line when we, we get the good better data, um, you know, we might be able to export that directly into the, the article um, rather than using what was in the manuscript, you know, perhaps making a, a clearer table of the funders um, rather than a, a sort of paragraph in the text. Um, the QA steps that we've mentioned, um, again, it adds time to your workflow. 
So I'd say be prepared for that. We did try and get the, uh, the compositor to, to do some of the checking steps for us, but we found, you know, it was creating a lot of author queries, which, um, like Susan said, you know, we, we don't want to burden the authors too much um, unnecessarily. So um, we found having the production editors do some of those checking steps, they were able to make the judgment call on, you know, which funder really was intended here. Um, so that, that ended up being the best route for us. Um, and the license that we spoke about, it, yeah, it's taken us a long time. It involves lawyers, though time, money. Um, but we, we finally got there in the end, and we will be sharing our URL for our license. Um, I think in, in John, you're going to do a blog at the end that we'll, we'll share that information. All right. Oh, sorry. Uh, and uh, Tracy? Great. Uh, I think as far as, uh, I'm just going to start with the bumps in the road, and I think that um, the biggest, I guess the two bumps were that we didn't have the resources that we really um, needed in our pretty small office to like pay full attention to this while we had other um, higher priority projects going on. Um, and what, what was hard for us is really the license because we are moving from a copyright um, a license, a traditional copyright with a one-year embargo um, to several kinds of public access mm -hmm. reuse licensees. And so, um, and, and this is partly, um, for example, so we used to have, um, if, if authors required it, we would have CC by no derivatives. Um, but as you all know, Gates, the Gates Foundation has come out um, pretty recently, I think, mm -hmm. um, with having to have a, a CC by, so that required us to, you know, ha have like still another kind of license, and because some authors are worried about uh, folks changing their work, um, but they still want free to read. So the license part is actually really um, complicated, um, and JAS 1.1 actually allows you to have multiple licenses, including like a publisher proprietary license, and that's something that you can create yourself that fulfills some of the more complex scenarios, um, but not um, the public access requirement necessarily. So in any case, it's, it's been really confusing, um, but uh, that, that's that been, I guess, the most significant bump. But we anticipate um, this should all be cleaned up within, um, hopefully by the spring, start of the new year. All right, thank you. Uh, so uh, it's now time for a Q&A for the uh, panelists and, and I see the usual suspects from Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, you can see <laughs> now, usually you guys are in the front row. <laughs> All right, who's, who's first? I should apologize, but um, I won't. Um, John Ingalls, Cold Spring Harbor. Um, so uh, this, has been, this is very interesting and actually the most useful contribution to the chorus uh, conversation that's happened, I think, to hear from people who've actually gone through it. Um, I'm curious about whether you did any uh, author education, you know, explaining perhaps in advance that things are going to change and why and so on, in the possibly vain hope that they might be grateful for all your efforts on their behalf. Uh, before, before we answer the question, uh, can the folks on the phone hear the questions? Yes. Good, thanks. Susan, why don't we start with you? Um, it's a good question, John. I mean, I guess, no, we haven't done any author education. I mean, we certainly are um, very upfront on our website about our policies of depositing, you know, the um, final article to PubMed Central, and we're very um, upfront with our NIH authors that that um, uh, represents compliance for them. Um, it's a good point with the other agencies. We haven't yet tackled that, so um, it's, a good, it's a good point. Is that fair, Rob? Thank you. Uh, any, uh, from COB, any comment on the question? Uh, yeah, again, a very good question, John, and the answer is also no, um, <laughs> we didn't. Um, I guess it's that assumption that the author coming to you knows their funder requirements, but we actually know that that's not true because they always get them wrong. <laughs> so um, I, <laughs> we, are we, again, are, are fairly clear on our website. Um, we, we do say that if your fans at funder mandates any aspect of open access, then we recommend that they pay for gold open access, but that we will comply with any mandate from any funder to allow an author to publish with us. So, um, we, yeah, we haven't really gone down um, an education route. 
Uh, Tracy, any comment on the question? <laughs> Just ditto. Um, <laughs> <laughs> question. <laughs> and no, but we should actually, because this is one of those, uh, those uh, I think, pretty complicated and time-consuming tasks that we undertake, um, you know, on behalf of our authors that we really should uh, have prepared when they ask us what we do for them. So thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so I, was, I, I, I like... Um, I like the, uh, the the comment from from Claire. The the authors know the their uh, funders' requirements, and they are wrong. <laughs> no, uh, I, oh, I was going to say oh, go I was going to say thank you, Tracy and Claire. It's very nice to be sitting up here in the panelist alone, but to know that we're all the same and not having tackled the uh, education here. But I do think you know one of the things that will help us is that we do now have our dashboards. We know what articles you know are being funded and what have you. And I think as the um, funding agencies start to implement their policies, we will start getting feedback from authors going like, basically, help, you know, mm -hmm. my renewal's coming up, what do I do? So yeah. I think at least this will give us, um, with tracking our dashboards, some sense of the scale of the um, issues and education that we'll need to do. Uh, Richard? Uh, Richard Sever, uh, Cold Spring Harbor as well. Um, Susan, I'm intrigued about your choice to take the funding information from the acknowledgements. If I remember rightly, one of the problems with um, FundRef and um, compliance with all this in particular was that the, um, the accuracy of what authors say about who funded the work is quite low. So, well, it's not high, let's put it, put it the other way. Um, and so what I wondered was, is with GSA and COB, they're explicitly making a request to the author, please provide the funding information. Mm -hmm. So maybe they have, I don't know, their 80% chance of getting the right answer or kind of at least uh, you know, a good shot at who actually provided the funding. Do you think if you're pulling it from the acknowledgements that your percentage would be even lower? Well, we are presenting it to the authors, right, Rob? So the authors have got a chance to, to validate. I mean, I guess, you know, ultimately, what will really make this most efficient is if we've got, as publishers, some way of validating what the author has given us through the funding agency. I mean, that's the dream world, right? Because, you know, um, with, with authors, you're dealing with a huge number. Not everybody's going to get it right. Um, so if you've got some independent way of validation, that will solve it. NSF is, 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 is unique in the funding agencies at the moment in that we do have a way of actually adding that grant number. So if you will, validating that that article was authored by somebody who was funded. So say in your acknowledgements, do you have in your instructions to authors that acknowledgements should include funding information? Is that one of your things in your acknowledgement guidelines? Uh, Rob is nodding for me. My, <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's, it's even hard to see when you nod here Rob, in the front row, Rob, but I can affirm that my colleague Rob is nodding, so we do. Right. Alison? Oh, sorry, was there another oh, question? Uh, comment? From folks on the phone, maybe? Oh. So you would have noticed in COB's slide, the, the slide of bumps in the road was all about getting funding data from the author at submission. Um, so we just avoid that completely, and we go straight to the acknowledgments, and we present it in table format in our proof and have the authors correct things there. We were finding that um, there are rarely corrections. The authors go with what they have in their acknowledgments. We know they're tagged correctly because we trust our copy editors who are making sure it's tagged correctly. That's correct, but I, yeah, it, like Susan said, until there's validation, there's really no way to do that. I mean, the author has to present it somewhere, whether it's at submission or in acknowledgments. There's, there's no way around that. So we do Allison, then Wayne. Yeah, Rob, uh, Rob just addressed my comment, which was that it looks like there was a lot of effort to make the automation work, and maybe if it's a starting effort, it might not be a good way to go, just taking a hit in manuscript prep and copy editing. Thank you. Wayne? Oh, hi. Wayne Manis, Cold Spring Harbor. Um, talking to John just now, we had a question. When there are many authors, is it just the corresponding author? Some of the genomic papers could have dozens. Are all the agencies needing to be... Um Yes, and thank you for asking that question, Wayne, because I thank guess it's one of the things that I never really recognized that... Um, 
I mean, I guess I'd recognized it, but not really intellectualized it. So yeah, if you look at any of the, I, I think the majority of the papers that we publish, and I mean by we collectively, will acknowledge more than one funding source. And so, yes, if you have a paper um, that acknowledges both NIH and NSF, the corresponding, it, it's irrelevant where the corresponding author is, that the authors of that paper have to abide by the public access policies of all of the funders that are listed on there. So that's why deposit, for instance, into um, um, PubMed Central is not sufficient for, for NSF. But that has to be so. So it adds to a whole level of complexity there. Again, speaking to the fact that, as I say, um, funding agencies are, are very, very different in their approaches, but they all want to be recognized. All right. Uh, so we have one more question, then we'll go on break. Thank you. Um, my name is Meredith Moravati. I'm here um, as a partner representing Dryad, and we're doing a um, pilot right now with the National Science Foundation, ingesting some grant information provided by a um, a submitter for data, mm -hmm. and they're providing their grant information, and then we're doing kind of this is a pilot and testing uh, different things with the National Science Foundation. One of the things that I th I'm wondering is going to be found is that one of the incentives of getting that grant number correct is that their data package with Dryad, it, the fee is paid. So there might be um, a little bit of an incentive to make sure it's correct. Um, one of the things we're not really doing on this pilot because we're testing you know, people putting in wrong grant numbers or grant numbers from expired grants or you know, that kind of thing, we're actually finding when we test the validation with the US National Science Foundation that the validation tool only works about 90 or 80 percent of the time. A, a percentage of the time we're actually checking um, automatically and it's saying the grant number isn't valid and then we do further digging and find out that indeed it is. Great, thank you for testing that. I mean, I think and it also speaks to early on, you know, with the, um, the actual um, metadata with the codes for funding agencies. I mean, these were originally called or, or created from the, um, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting what it's called, Scopus database, right? And so one of the great things that I think has happened um, uh, with Chorus is, you know, getting the funding agencies with whom we have partnerships with to look at that metadata to say, is this you know, um, categorized and classified in the right way um, so we can actually make sure that we're actually, you know, as I say, tagging stuff the way that the funding agencies see themselves organized. But 80 to 90%, we should chat later. Thank you for that information, it was really good. Well, thank you, uh, thank you uh, all of you, and uh, especially uh, panelists, Rob included, uh, and uh, those who are uh, calling in remotely. Uh, thanks very much. We are on a break now. Uh, until 11.15, then back in this room. Thanks. Thanks, Susan.